All right, so first thing I know is um, this is official nap time. Is that right? Uh, we just ate. And, and so here's the thing that I learned a long time ago as a preacher. Uh, I was just starting into preaching, and I had an older gentleman come up to me, and he says, Mitch, I don't want you to be offended if I fall asleep during the sermon. Um, if you see me nodding my head off, then just assume that I'm agreeing with what you're saying. I'm like, you know what? That's a great way that I have no problem. So if this is the time that you're like, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm checking out. Uh, these are uncomfortable chairs. There's better chairs right out there. But no offense uh, t uh, taken from me. I, I mentioned this in the last uh, class that I've got several here from, uh, from my home congregation just up the road, and none of them uh, showed up for my class. And I'm like... <laughs> But this, this one, I can at least say I've got two of them right here. And so they're gluttons for punishment or something. I'm not sure what. It's just great support. Uh, Chris is actually one of my coworkers. He's a, he's a friend of mine uh, for sure. And so I'm honored to have him in, in here. Um, as well, the other thing that I know. So one is it's that time, you know, whenever we, we could be tired. So I'm going to have some interaction to help with that because I know t just listening to someone, is not always the uh, most enjoyable part of uh, whenever you're fighting off the sleepies. The second thing is, uh, you need to know this. Wes, uh, who we just heard, right, did a great job. He was in my class first, and uh, there, he stole my material. No, not all of it. <laughs> uh, we were ch chatting about it later uh, that, uh, that I was like, it's really cool that we can both come to similar ideas and not steal each other's thunder, but just support uh, one another. So the uh, first class, they kind of got the preempt to, to what Wes uh, was saying in here. So you guys are going to get a little bit more kind of the, of the follow-up uh, of some things that work uh, together within that. The other thing that I learned from Wes is I am now officially going to be called the other Mitch, just to make that clear. So I'm, I'm the other Mitch. I assume that uh, you really don't know uh, much about me, and that's, that's totally fine. Uh, so I'm going to introduce maybe a few more things. So yes, I've been preaching minister uh, at Western Heights Church of Christ for 10 years, a little over that now, which is, I, I've been told by every preacher that's a huge milestone, um, but they don't say for who, whether it's me or the church. Um, I'm thinking the church, that's a huge milestone for. But uh, I, I've been doing ministry for close to 20 years, and uh, that's, it, it's, it's a joy, and I, I love that. I started some ministry while I was uh, doing my master's work, and uh, there's ups and downs and all, all throughout it, but I met my wife while at Harding, and uh, together we have three daughters. Ages are, vary, <laughs> depending on who you ask, uh, but uh, I, I, I want to share a couple things about my daughters, and uh, for one of which, three daughters, I've had a lot of people ask me, like, hey, do you want to try for that son? No. And here, here's why. I realized after my third daughter that the Lord answered a prayer that I had whenever I was in high school. I, I, selfish prayer, I get it, but I said, Lord, please surround me with beautiful women. <laughs> this is the best answer to the prayer I ever could have imagined. It has been fantastic and wonderful, and my daughters are amazing. Okay, I got a 16-year-old, and, and she's a junior in, in high school. And she, the Sherman High School is a large 5A. We are about to turn 6A, all right? And I tell you that because I want to share this one cool fact about her. She's number one in her class. Wow. Yeah, it's really cool. She's also first chair in, her, uh, in the band um, that she's doing. And my middle daughter, same thing. She is super smart, one in the class, first chair in the band. And the reason I share that with you is because for some reason... I think if you think my girls are awesome, you might think I'm awesome. Isn't that how it works? See, a lot of times that's, that's what we do in our lives is we try to take credit for things that we really can't take credit for. I mean, whenever I look at my girls, I look at these, my two oldest girls, and I look at them, and I'm like, dude, they are amazing. That had to come from me somehow. Now, my wife reminds me it came from her, and she's right. But the thing is, I, I want to take some credit for it. And I want to say, well, I had, inf I had some, some control in this, and I made this happen, right? Well, if that's true, then I need to tell you about my youngest daughter. So my youngest daughter would be complete opposite on academic scale than my other two. She's quite possibly the last academically in her grade. 
Now, that's really no fault of her own. She is uh, special needs. She's got cerebral palsy, limited speech. And it dawned on me, whenever I try to take credit that I controlled the outcome of my older daughters being smart and you know, being good musically and all these things, what did I do or not do to affect my youngest? Was it really part of my control? Was it some sin that I had? Am I at fault for her being not normal? And this is a constant prayer, to be completely honest. On my way down here this morning, as I'm, I'm driving, it's 45-minute drive from Sherman to here, not bad. Um, so I'm, I'm praying. I'm praying over this day. I'm praying just the things that are coming up with our church family, and I'm praying for my family. And I kid you not, whenever I go for my family, it is a constant prayer with my youngest one. My, my older ones, it's like, man, I, I pray that they navigate this well, that they, they stay strong in the Lord and all these things. And in some ways, my prayer heads for my youngest one. God, why, why can't, what did I do? Why can't she be normal? What did I mess up? And I'm trying to take control for something that doesn't have an easy answer. And that's the dilemma, I think, that we all deal with in our own way. We want to take credit for things that we really didn't have much part in. And we want to kind of disown some things that maybe we did have some part in. Let me illustrate it in a way that might uh, gather us more in this together rather than just my story. Um, how many of you have a favorite sports team? You're like, this is my team, all right? Doesn't matter who it is. Um, when you watch per, that team, whether you go to stadium and watch them or, or you're watching them on TV, do any of you have like a certain thing that you're going to wear when you watch them? Anyone? Maybe. Okay. I, I grew up, uh, that I grew up in the Oklahoma Panhandle, call this for what it was. I think the other Mitch, no, sorry, Mitch, I'm the other Mitch, <laughs> said that he was, he is a Texan doing mission work in Oklahoma. I'm the opposite. I'm an Oki that's doing mission work in Texas, and, and I'm even closer to that Red River rivalry uh, right there in Sherman. But I, look at, I grew up Oklahoma Panhandle, but my aunt was an avid, avid Cowboys fan. And anytime we came over for Thanksgiving, whenever it came time for the Cowboys to play, we were all in that room, and she had changed her outfit to make sure she was wearing the jersey because it was good luck. Now, you may have done this playing sports, if any of you did that, that uh, you have a certain, like, it's your socks, or it, it's, some guys, it's a certain pair of underwear we're going to wear at every game, because one game we won, and now it must be the fault or credit to what we were wearing. Or maybe you've had this one, uh, you're, watching, you're watching your team play, you get up to go to the restroom, and they score. And when you come back, everyone else says, nope, sorry, you can't watch your bad luck. Isn't it funny how we attribute things that have absolutely no bearing upon a situation to say we now somehow are fixing or we are addressing that issue, that ex excitement, that outcome? We do this all the time, but we don't really have control over those kinds of outcomes. What you wear does not matter to the sports team. It's weird to say that, but it really doesn't matter if you show up to the game wearing their colors or not. They're going to play as they're going to play. Same is true in life and in parenting, and we're going to talk more about that. Um, psychologists will say, will, will talk about this, this control desire that we have as the illusion of control. I like this kind of terminology because control is an illusion. Uh, the illusion of control is the tendency for people to overestimate their ability to control events. So in other words, if I really do think that me wearing a certain outfit to watch the Rangers play contributed to their World Series, if I really think that, then you know what I'm going to do next season, every game? I'm going to wear that outfit. And if it doesn't work, then the Rangers should be calling me if they, if they fail, if they lose a game, they should be calling me saying, Mitch, were you wearing the outfit because that controlled the outcome? No, that's silly. 
But here's also how silly it is. I, I'm not going to ask how many people play, uh, you know, will uh, gamble with the lottery. But studies show that uh, lottery is not good odds. You know that, right? Lottery is just not good odds. People are willing to put money down, more money down in a lottery that they have chosen the numbers for. So in other words, they were, if they feel like they have picked the numbers, they're going to put more money down. But if they were just handed numbers, they're not going to put much money down for it. And it's a really interesting thing. Because over and over it shows that people, if they can say, well, this is my birthday, and this is my mom's birthday, and this is my granddad's birthday, those numbers are lucky. People are going to buy in to the lottery. And the odds are the same. In fact, the odds are stacked against anyone. And it doesn't change a thing. In fact, there's actually some evidence that when someone else gives you the lottery ticket uh, number of their cho choosing or just their random, there's actually a little bit better chances. That's interesting. Now, don't take that as me warranting, hey, go buy a lot lottery ticket. It's just an interesting psychological uh, study here. So the illusion of control. What really do we have control over? What does that look like? What does that mean? Well, this is a class we're going to participate some. So if I can get the first class, I went through six markers in here. Um, only because they didn't work, not because I'm horribly bad on markers. But I'm going to draw a circle, um, and I want you to imagine that in this circle is everything that you can control, okay? Everything that is within your control. Outside of the circle is the things that you can't control. So we're going to talk about what is inside this circle. So this is a class. I want some participation, and you're going to see how bad my spelling is whenever I try to write down what you give me, all right? But what are some things that you would say is in your control? Just give me some answers. What, I eat. what you eat. What else? What you wear. Where? Attitude. Attitude. Your reactions. Reactions. What was that? Communication. Communication. What else? Your, your speed limit? <laughs> your, I need to say your speed. Not the limit, that's uh, by someone else, but what your speed. Okay, <laughs> I like that one. We might have to. Well, now that sounds like a drug. I should probably <laughs> limit. Let's go with that. Okay. <laughs> that changed into a different class all of a sudden. <laughs> yes. <My> snooze. Snooze. <laughs> okay. Okay, um, yeah, watch and listen. Oh, effort. effort. Association. I had half a mind to abbreviate association, and then I realized I probably shouldn't. Um, I'm glad I... I'll give, the, I'll give the Christian answer of all these weeks. Okay, so, yeah, follow. Tell you what, I'm going to... Can I modify that? Who we follow? There you go. Yeah, okay. Who we follow, okay? Okay, education. It's gonna run out of rooms in, in the circle. What else? Thoughts, okay. Thoughts, image. Friends. Y'all are more talkative than the first class, so thank you. This is great. <laughs> Would have drawn a bigger circle had I known. Anything else? That you, you'd like to add? I mean, we go, there's a lot of things. Here, here's the thing that I realize as well. Um, we are in a church setting. I mean, we're in a church building. And so it's kind of akin to, in a lot of ways, it's akin to uh, the, the story I heard about a, a Sunday school class. Teacher has all the kids uh, there, and just, just to get the conversation going, get the kids talking, uh, she asked, what, what is small, furry, wags a tail, and likes to lick people? And, and no one was answering. And you can see they're kind of agitated. The kids are struggling with this. And finally, like, she keeps on asking. It keeps on asking. And finally, one of the boys just ra raises her hand and said, Miss, 
I know the answer is Jesus, but why does he look like a dog? <laughs> so sometimes in a church setting, we kind of go with the Jesus answers, and that's great. That is no problem. We're going to talk about that more, but I also want to just add one thing to your, th uh, your, your thinking here. Aren't there plenty of other things that you try to control throughout the day that don't fit in this, uh, that aren't here? And we don't, this is not therapy and this is not confession time to put in all of our stuff. But I want you to also think your daily life. How many things do you try to put in a circle? How many things are you trying to control every day, every minute that you are breathing, that you're trying to control? Because that list is actually pretty extensive, isn't it? Now, psychologists um, that talk about the illusion of control will sum this up by saying there are only two things that you can control, and only two. Everything else fits within those two. A lot of those are mimicked in what you've already said. Some of them not, and we'll talk, we'll talk about that. The two things that he says that you can control, attitude and behavior. Now, I like the, uh, putting it down that simple to these two things, attitude and behavior. It's, for one, I like simple lists. That's a pretty easy list. But if you think about it, everything that is within my ability to control does fit within those two understandings. It's, and they are complementary. Because what you believe about something will affect what you do. And so your attitude about something will reflect your behavior, and both those things are squarely under my control. There are certain things that aren't under my control. Um, I, again, I, I'm not, I'm not going to pick apart too many of these. I'll, I'll, I'll pick on one. What we learn, our education, there's a level in which, yes, that fits within my attitude and behavior, right? But also in there a place that that's completely out of my control. In that part of the debate within Texas, uh, don't we have a proposition coming up about funding uh, for public schools or not, of what that would look like? And part of the argument is some people do not live in great areas to get great education, while others live in more affluent areas and can have access to great education. And I say that as one that lives in one of those great areas. I mean, we just built a brand new high school and it's amazing. It's career technical education wing, whole section of the school is amazing. And I didn't have that growing up. And here's the thing, they still don't have that where I grew up. So there's a level in which, yeah, I can control what I learned, but also there's a level in which there's some things that are out of, out of my control that are played into just because of circumstances. So the reason I want to bring up the control about our attitude and our behavior is because a lot of times we get two concepts mixed up. Our two concepts that we often get mixed up is control and influence. This is where you can hear some of Wes's uh, talk come in, all right? Influence is not control. These are different ideas. We can have influence over certain things that we don't even control, things that are outside of our circle. We can still influence. But whenever we think that influence is control, we get into some problems. So let me ask you this. What happens when we try to control something that is outside of our circle of control? What happens in us? Frustration. What was it? Resentment. Resentment. What else? Anger. Anything else? Apathy. Ooh, some apathy. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Anxiety. Anxiety. And why? Why do those things come within us when we try to control things that are out of our control? Any thought? Futile. Okay, it's futile. It's a great point. It is futile. And we don't want it to be. The reason we're trying to control it is because we want to affect an outcome, but we can't have this. It's, it's not just an easy math equation where this plus this, you know, A plus B equals C. 
if I do this and do that, then it will give me this outcome because it doesn't work like that. There are things that are out of our control, but whenever we try to have control over them, it breaks re relationships. Have you noticed that? I mean, have you ever been around someone that has their, has their thoughts about how things should be about you? And you're like, hold up. Why are you forcing that upon me? They're trying to control. And we get frustrated when people try to do it to us, yet we still try to do it to others. So let me ask the other side of this. What happens when we try to influence something that is out of our control? Not within our realm of control, we just try to influence it. What happens? How do you, what happens within you? Okay, we can get creative. I like that. Do you want to expand or was that good? Strategize. Yeah, we, there's a different strategy that's involved. Okay, I like that. Okay, so there is a level of excitement that can happen with influence, that's for sure. What else? We may like feel less attached to the outcome. Ooh, yes. A little less attached to the outcome. What else? All right, I, lo I love that idea, the, uh, uh, that hope comes. Uh, you have to have a measure of hope and influence because it really is saying, I don't know where this is going to go, but I'm hoping I'm going to influence toward this path, toward this route. Take back to my daughters, you know, being amazing, uh, first in their class, great. I can influence them by encouraging them to study, do their homework. I can influence them for that. But I can't control that they will actually do it or do it well in a way that fits with their studying style and all those things. I can't control that, but I can influence within there. Okay? What else happens with influence? You kind of get frustrated sometimes, too, because you know that even if you try to influence it, it may not go the way you want it to. Okay, so... In, it, I'm going to draw a line in, in these ideas. There's a level in which, even when we try to influence, it may not go like we want it to. That is still the language of control. And that's the interesting, hard line uh, to talk about, is that the way that I want it to is language of control. Whenever I want something to be a certain way, no matter how good that way is, that is language of control influence is leading to that but being really honest of saying it may not end up the way that i want it but i'm going to influence the way that i know and see what happens there's a difference it helps in our relationships think about this with your kids did you have something that okay <laughs> stretching that's fine you can do that you think about this with your kids um my oldest daughter turned 16, and it's fantastic. I absolutely love having another driver in the house. It is glorious, because you know, before they turn 16, they're involved with a bunch of stuff, and I have to get them there. Now, whenever my oldest daughter's 16, she can even take her sister to stuff, and now I can kind of enjoy sitting on my couch a little bit more, being lazy. I don't get to be lazy, but you know, I enjoy that. Now, here's the thing, there's freedom, but it is scary to have a daughter driving. I don't care where you live. That is scary. And I want to control everything about it. Any other parents with me here? Man, I want to control everything about the driving experience. So I may set some ground rules for my daughter when she drives. Like, I think they're pretty good at ground rules. One's like, you know, don't be on your phone. There's certain roads I want you to avoid, construction, we got some bad construction in Sherman, do not take this exit, it's not safe, don't do that. Okay, so parameters, don't turn your music up too loud because it can distract you, I'm going for all these things, trying to have control in the effort to be safe, right? 
But in all my effort to control my daughter, will she always be safe? Why not? Because there's other idiots on the road. And sometimes my daughter is one of those idiots on the road. I mean, I have to admit that because she's learning from this idiot on the road sometimes. All right, so the thing is, I want to control things, but I can only influence. Think about just the, the rule of not having your music up too loud. Can I really control that whenever she's driving? If I'm not in the car? Now, I could check up on her, you know, whenever you... Uh, pull into like yeah, whenever you've been listening to music and you pull into the driveway you turn off your car have you ever gotten back in the next morning and realized you're not the same person that you were the previous day <laughs> like the music way too loud you're like i was a different person yesterday because that music different uh, i could go check her but even with that she would get smart and say if i still want to listen to music loud i just turn it down before i turn the car off so i'm still not controlling i have to influence and whenever I strive to influence, it changes things. It allows me to have some conversations with my daughter as to why. Why is this important? It's not just a rule. There's a why behind it. There's a why behind all of these things. And when you're talking about influence, that's what you're talking about. Churches uh, struggle with the difference between control and influence quite often. I don't know it, what your background tradition is. Mine is I was born, bred in the Church of Christ. Okay, so I grew up uh, with all the traditional rules, as you might have them. I'm going to pick on um, our, the a cappella singing for a second. I grew up with the explanation of why we have a cappella and not instruments is because instruments are sinful, they're bad, don't do it. And that was kind of the end of the story. Now, as a kid, that was enough for me. Because sin meant hell, and I don't want to go to hell, so that easy enough. I just no instruments. Good, great, no problem. That's the language of control, though. It wasn't until I was later in college and even starting in ministry that I realized that. And so now the conversation is very different. Whenever I preach about a cappella, and by the way, I'm, I'm a huge fan of singing. I'm a huge fan of the human voice. And also, I think scripture has some wonderful things to say about that. But now, whenever I talk about it, I don't talk about the evil of one side, because that's the language of control. What I do is I talk about what is, here's a scripture, what do we think this is saying? Why would this be important? And I'm asking questions of influence rather than demanding things of control. Now, I'm not doing that perfect, but isn't that a better way to go about even things like parenting? Instead of just saying, here's the rules, stick by them, it's all that you can do, that causes a lot of rebellion. In fact, that's what the story of the Old Testament is over and over, is there's rules, they're clear, and we would like to say, man, if I lived in Old Testament times, I would follow the rules. They're really easy. Like, we in New Testament times kind of long for a little bit more uh, structure on some rules. Like, is dancing really wrong, or is there some acceptable dancing? Is, like, line dancing okay? Or is it whenever we go to partner dancing, that's whenever babies happen? Like, what do I do here? Uh, sorry, I, that's what I was told. I, I don't know. But <laughs> we get this mentality, and we're wondering and asking, like, it would just be great if Paul in Colossians said, here's, here's the rules. But the thing is, in the Old Testament, we had that, and people rebelled. Because whenever only de uh, the demand is for the rules, that's language of control. This is what the Pharisees were so good at. The Pharisees were the language of control over and over again. And that's why Jesus has some of his harshest criticisms on the Pharisees. All right, so that's all set up. <laughs> How long have we gone? <laughs> Where we're going is the parable of the sower. The parable of the sower is a fantastic parable. So many things to be said about there. That th there's this picture that Jesus gives of a man who is just throwing seeds out willy-nilly. And the reason I say that is because I grew up on a farm. Whenever you plant seed, like you only buy what you can plant and you make sure you plant them in rows and you're doing all these things. And so whenever I read this story, I'm like, what kind of farmer is this? Like, he's not a very good one. He's just throwing seed anywhere, like, willy-nilly. Like, that's fine. Jesus is making a point. He said, what if? 
What if you treated the word of God like that? What if you treated the message, the good news that you have within you, and you're like, I don't care who this spills on, I'm going to throw it everywhere. I'm going to make sure it goes everywhere. That's the first point that Jesus is making, is saying, we should be like that. The, the good news should be flowing out of us so much. Our cups should be so full that if you're anywhere within our vicinity, you're going to get some Jesus spilled upon you. You're going to get some of that scattered upon you. So then what happens? Because that's the question we all have. All right, so if I'm doing, doing the job that I've been called to do and I'm sharing the good news, I want to see some effort. I, I, I want to see some, some results here. So Jesus tells the parable. Some seed falls in different places. And there's different results. Today, uh, in my class, we're, we're talking about the thorns. That some seed fell among the thorns. The, as the plant grew, the thorns choked it out. I want you to see Jesus' explanation as he's explaining this to his disciples of this passage. Matthew 13, 22. The seed falling among, among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. The thorns choke the word. Have you ever been in a smoky room, whether it be cigarette, cigar smoke, or something's on fire, smoke, and you have it, it's just an aversion to that. You don't want to be there. Choke is a pretty good word for that, isn't it? That, man, it's just thick and smoke, and I'm choking. Um, another picture, have you ever been at a restaurant, eating happily along with your family, and then someone, a piece of food gets caught? Choking is a good word for that, too, isn't it? But there's another picture that comes to mind whenever I read this passage here. And it's, the third picture is whenever someone's angry. They're really upset, so upset that they take their hands and wrap it around someone's neck and begin to squeeze. They're choking. That's the really the only one that is a uh, active the other two are kind of passive pictures this one's an active one which is the same voice that this has it's an active voice so let give me allow me a little bit of stretch to assume matthew and john are on the same page about what the word is in john 1 1 john tells this in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god he's talking about jesus so let's just assume that John connects the word logos to Jesus. And so when Matthew is using this, that could be Jesus. So now I want you to imagine the thorns choking Jesus out of your life. It's a pretty strong visual image, isn't it? And the thing is, the thorns is what I've allowed to choke Jesus out. The thorns is something that I have welcomed into my life. Through my control and even through my influence, I have allowed the thorns to come in. And so Jesus will talk about these thorns with two pictures, two illustrations, two issues to deal with. And so we're going to deal with the same. We're going to talk about the same. First is this, the worries of this life. Said, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth ch choke the word, making it unfruitful. So let me ask you this. What are things that you worry about? They can be general. They don't have to be specific. But what are some things you worry about? Yeah. Kids. Safety. Job. Safety. Health. Health. What else? Finances. Finances. <laughs> it's funny, these are broad, but all of us are like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. May not be the same. We may have a, a slightly different worry within here, but whenever you talk in broad terms, it's like, yeah, that hits me. Yeah, that's a worry I have. What, this may, may be a little bit different, but let's just put on the hat of our kids. What do our kids worry about? What was that? 
acceptance. <laughs> that doesn't mean we don't worry about acceptance. We just cope with it differently, uh, I think, now. Because, believe me, we definitely still worry about acceptance. Um, but kids, it's, it's on their sleeve. What else? Anything else specific for kids that you can think of? Acceptance is a pretty big one. Self-esteem. Self-esteem. Mm. So acceptance from others and acceptance of self. They kind of fit within the same idea, don't they? Life choices. Life choices. Some life situations also. Even if they're not their choice, they worry about it. Yeah, none of us did. Yeah, now, like, I grew up in the Oklahoma Panhandle. We had drills for tornadoes, which, <laughs> I'm just going to be honest, that our drill for tornado was to get under our desk, which was the same drill for just about anything else that might come our way. I mean, just get under the desk. I was convinced that that desk was, like, just, just it would withstand anything, right? Um, now they have drills for shootings, and it's like, it boggles my mind, um, but also at the same time, I'm like, yeah, it's the world we live in. It is something to be worried about. So let me ask you this. Why do we worry? Because we don't trust. Because we don't trust? Okay. Great. What else? It's, in control. it's, not, it's outside of our control. Do you realize you don't really worry about things that are within your control. If your attitude and behavior, going, pointing here, but that was on the screen, um, if your attitude and behavior are the things that you can control, you don't typically worry about your attitude in a situation. <laughs> I got teenage girls. <laughs> they don't worry about their attitude. They'll give it to me anytime with no worries, right? That's... You don't worry about that. What you worry about is things that aren't in your control. And so all those things that we listed already, all those things that are worried within us are things that we are then trying to control that we can't. Worry and anxiety are closely related, if not similar. Um, so we create worries within ourselves of things that we can't control. And that's part of the, the it's difficult um, because when this comes in reality, I, I'm going to pick on the one, someone said uh, safety somehow. Yeah, it's something. So going back with the illustration of my daughter driving, yeah, I want her to be safe and I might worry about her safety. But I don't as much. And the only reason I, I don't is because um, I ministered through COVID. And... If y'all remember that, you know, it wasn't all that long ago, and in some ways still in it. But it was hard to be a minister in this because the thing that I heard most was worries about safety. We're worried about, is this safe? We're worried about, are we, uh, uh, just you name it, and it was it all encompassed into safety. And what the Lord was doing in my heart during that time was reminding me Mitch, I have not called you to safety. I have called you to faithfulness. I'm wondering, like I, 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 and I even told our congregation this, I wonder, first century, second century, third century Christians, you know, the early Christians, especially the ones uh, coming towards the persecutions, the ones that we have stories of, that they are put up on a, a pole covered in tar and lit on fire to light the, the parties of, the, of an emperor, those Christians, if they were living during COVID, what would they have said to us? What would they have shared? Those who were giving their life, and I'm not downplaying that COVID was it, it still is real, and it affected a whole bunch of lives. It took too many lives. But at the same time, what it also took was living from Christians because we were willing to try to control safety, something that we could never control. That was out of our control. You can't control those things. And yes, there's science here, but also the science 
over here. And it was difficult. And that may be even offensive now, just depending on your story. And I apologize for that. Um, that is not my point, is to be offensive in COVID talk, but more so just to bring it up of saying, there are things in our life that we're trying to control and things that we are worried about because we're trying to control. And Jesus has some advice for us. Here's Jesus' advice in Luke 12. Then turning to his disciples, Jesus said, this is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food to eat or enough clothes to wear, for life is more than food and your body is more than clothing. Look at the ravens. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for God feeds them. And you are far more valuable to him than any birds. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? I love that question. Because, I mean, when Jesus asks a rhetorical question, you know, remain silent. But at the same time, my life, whenever I stack my life up to that statement, I'm like, well, yeah, surely it can. Because the way that I live is trying to promote a further life. In fact, adding moments to our life is probably a motto in America that we didn't realize. I mean, we are, we are going to continue finding ways to extend our life, finding ways to, to try to cheat death. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? We know the answer, but we don't live it too often. And if worry can't accomplish a little thing like that, which is funny that Jesus says, it, adding to your life, Adding moments to your life is a little thing. I love that. What's the use in worrying about bigger things? Just imagine for a second how many human lifespans God has lived through. The statement makes a whole lot more sense, right? If we're going to add a moment to our life, he's like, your life is just but a moment. It's a breath. It's a vapor. I mean, that's what scripture says. It's here today and gone tomorrow. It's really quick. In the eyes of God, Adding a moment to your life and worrying and stressing about adding a little bit to your life is so small. And it's not something that you can even control. His point, though, is we don't need to worry. We can't control them. But we can give it to God. Let me go back to... Um, this idea of control and uh, influence. We talked about when we control something that's outside of our control, we get anxiety, it's a struggle, it's, it's things like that. What happens when we try to influence something that is out of our control? So we were chatting about that. Here's the one piece that I want to come back to in that conversation. When God created humanity in his omnipotence, he could have placed humanity within his circle of control. You realize that? He could force you to do whatever he wanted because he created you. But where did God place you? He actually placed you outside of his control. Because we're not robots, as we might talk about it now. We have a thing called free will. And the beauty of that means that God... I mean, it, sometimes we want God to just, you know, sing with Carrie Underwood, Jesus take the wheel. We just want him to be in control. But the thing is, what God wants is relationship with us. He wants to pave the way, influence the path before us so that we will come to him. Because that's a better relationship than a controlling one. How much, if we take the cues from God, would that work with our kids? Would that work with our grandkids? That instead of just trying to control the relationship, we influenced and saying, you have free will. I know that you're probably going to mess up. I know that you're not going to do everything the way that I would. And in some ways, that might be awesome. Because you might do better. But my hope is that we have a relationship. When we try to control, we end up struggling in the relationship. Worry forces our focus away from God, and it puts it on ourselves. That's what worry does. We don't trust, someone said, we don't trust in God. 
we are now trusting in ourselves. Worry forces us to become ingrown, and anything that is ingrown becomes infected unless it's dealt with. So that's what we're up against. So how do we deal with the worrying thoughts that fill our minds? I read a study that showed the average human being will have about 80,000 thoughts a day. The men is about seven <laughs> thoughts, period. No, I'm kidding. Uh, 80,000 on average thoughts a day, which is insane. But here's the crazy part of that statistic. 80% of those thoughts on average are negative thoughts. At first I wanted to say, well, no, that can't be the case. And then I started evaluating my thoughts and I was like, whew, <laughs> maybe it's more real than I thought. The things that I don't talk about, things that I don't let out of my head, but yeah, a lot of them are negative. So here's a question for you. Where do negative thoughts come from? Unmet expectations, okay. What was that? Lack of knowing who you are. Lack of knowing who you are. Okay. Comparison. Comparison. Fear. Fear. My response to somebody that I was trying to influence and I didn't feed their thoughts or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Responses. So we have thoughts as part of what someone said is under our control. But here's the question. If 80% of our thoughts are negative and you have the ability to choose what you think, then why are we choosing negative thoughts 80% of the time? Like if you have the ability to choose, wouldn't you choose not to have those thoughts? So what if thoughts, that's not gonna work erasing, is not something that's in our control? What if, what if thoughts is something that's actually out of our control? Still attitude, how we respond to those thoughts, behavior, how we respond because of the, our attitude with those thoughts, those are within our control. But what if the origination of thought isn't actually our control? What would that do? What, what, would, be, what would that mean, I guess? We'd have to find another origin of thoughts, right? So give me another origin. Where would thoughts come from? Where would negative thoughts come from? We'll start with the easy one. What was that? Satan. Satan. What if there's a thing called spiritual warfare? I mean, we know what there is, right? What if one of the jobs that God allowed Satan to have was the influence, because we know Satan can't control us either. God did not give the power. You cannot blame Satan for the bad things that you've done. Oh, it's just Satan in me. <laughs> Sorry, what is Satan doing in you? Get him out. It's not good. You know, it doesn't bode well for people. What if God can't control, Satan can't control, in fact, no one else, whether powers or other humans, can control another human? in what's within their control, okay? They can't, they can only influence the things that are within their control. So what if Satan, as part of his influence of tactics, is able to plant thoughts in your mind to grow the seeds of anxiety and worries? Doesn't that seem like a pretty simple explanation of why we have so many negative thoughts? Doesn't that sound pretty accurate? Because it's a spiritual war. And God knows that what happens in the mind is really where the battle is happening. In fact, Romans 12 tells us that we should no longer conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed. How? By renewing your mind or changing the way you think. That's not just by having some sort of uh, system to be able to say, here's, here's the right way to think about things. That is great. That's wonderful. It's also recognizing that some of our thoughts are not our thoughts. They are Satan's thoughts implanted within us, giving us worry. 
And whenever we can communicate that to our kids, of saying, look, you're not bad for thinking that. Because there is a force outside of you that is planting that, fo- uh, that thought within you. Now I can have a conversation with my kid about spiritual warfare and about how to deal with Satan. Spiritual, uh, the, or, um, oh, no, Second Corinthians, sorry. I, got, uh, I wanted to give you this uh, passage before I left this. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Every thought we take captive. This doesn't mean we run everything simply by Christ. It means we check the origin of the thought. Is it from Christ or from something else? Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. All right. I honestly forgot what time we get out of here. Yep, we're supposed to. So here's the, here's the pieces that I want, uh, want to give you, uh, wrapping up. I apologize. The second thing that he mentions, and I'll just run through this really fast, all right? Deceitfulness of wealth. Material things can have such a mesmerizing effect on us that we trick ourselves into believing that we aren't as happy as we thought we were. We believe that we will never truly be happy until we have the object of our desire. So the first thing that he mentions in this text is saying the the anxiety, the worries of life. The second thing is the deception of wealth. Money is not the problem. The problem is money is deceptive. It cannot follow through on the promises. We chase after money, but it can't follow through on the promises that it presents. We think it'll give us safety. We think it'll give us security. It'll give us all all these things, and money can't do that. The only thing that can is God. And when we put our trust and our hope in things other than God, we're missing. We're missing the point. Um... Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Things you can control, attitude and behavior. Those are within your circle of control, so what have, where have you let your attitude and behavior stop the growth of Jesus in your life? Where have you allowed it within your kids? Their attitude and behavior stop the growth of Jesus in your life. Here's the last thought, man, and this one sticks me in the, right between the eyes so many times. If we are trying to be in control, the thorns are already winning. Jesus said he wants to be on the throne of our lives. And if I'm trying to take that control away from Jesus, I am letting the thorns choke Jesus off of my throne, that his throne in my life. And I'm trying to assume a role that I never could fully do. So don't let the thorns win. Don't let anything take away what you can control, but keep your control and influence in perspective. Can I pray for you? Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray. I pray that each of us recognizes the things that are within our control and the things that are not within our control. I pray that the influence that you, has been given to us by you and by those that we, uh, who have gone before us in faith, who have encouraged us, that that is what leads us into influencing others but Lord, may we never fall into the traps as, as the parable says that you, that you spoke so long ago. Fall into the traps of the worries of this life or the deception, uh, deceitfulness of wealth. I pray that we don't try to be in control of things that we were never meant to control. May we follow you through it all. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.